Last year we had the B-52 move, which was the longest overland journey for a B-52, and it was here in Tucson. It was actually in the back of Pima Air and Space Museum, and it went all the way up to uh, Oklahoma City. Goodness. It took three and a half weeks, or just shy of three and a half weeks. So that was an immense challenge. Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Now, one of the people I got to meet when I was out visiting the fabulous Pima Air and Space Museum was Ramon Purcell. And Ramon has one of the best jobs in the world, really. He gets to help move and photograph aircraft as they're going, sometimes on their last journey, but other times to new homes where they will be put back into stunning condition for the likes of you and I to be able to enjoy them. Now, you've probably seen some of Ramon's work, especially if you were following the coverage of Pima's stealth fighter being moved down to the museum. It was great fun to watch with all the updates, but what was even more cool was the B-52 they moved across the United States. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what goes into capturing a move like this or just general aviation photography because it's a little bit more involved than just showing up and pointing your camera at something. Now, there is one thing though. My microphone may have been next to my phone and it has picked up a little bit of static through the first half of this chat. So I apologize profusely for that. I've tried to clean it up as best I can. It hasn't gone as well as I would hope, but you can hear us chatting away and Ramon is great. As always, we have to start at the beginning. And I started by asking Ramon the simple question, how did Boneyard Safari come about? Boneyard Safari was sort of a, an outcome of, of a different project that I was working on. Uh, at the time, I was working as the photographer for Air Force Reserve recruiting, and uh, my boss had asked me for some of my personal work. He had said, hey, I'd like to see some of your personal work. And so I'm sitting there scratching my head. And I had been out here to Tucson and had had access to AMARG, you know, where the Boneyard proper is, mm -hmm. and had taken some stylized photos there where... Uh, the inspiration very much was based on the movie Traffic. Mm. And if you look at the movie Traffic, every scene has a different tone, color tone. And it's uh, uh, Benicio del Toro is a little bit washed out, a little bit more on the um, yellowish pastel side. And then uh, the different characters are dark and gloomy. And so you start associating each character, each scene as it changes. So each scene is or each character has a scene color and with that it starts telling its own story and so i looked at the aircraft that are in storage and um, at the time working as an advertising photographer I, I looked at everything and i said okay well what aircraft are going to fly again and what aircraft are not going to fly again and so i started basing the imagery where they're desaturated on aircraft that are highly likely not to ever fly again. And the ones that are a little bit more saturated are being regenerated and they're coming back to life. So people can instantly tell and look at the imagery and go, oh, okay, here's what's happening. So I showed this to my boss at the, uh, at the Air Force Reserve side and he was like, oh, this is really beautiful work. Cool, you can keep your contract and keep working for us. <laughs> like, oh, thanks. And he said, by the way, you, you have something here. I looked at him, I'm like, old aircraft in storage? Some new aircraft in storage? What, what? And so he kept prodding me. And because of that, um, Boneyard Safari came to be. And he had told me, he said, no, you, you really have something here. There's a story. And the thought process, it really was one of those seeds that was planted in my head, which I started looking at it. And I said, well, is this a fine art piece? Nobody really wants to buy pictures of old planes. Uh, and then I started thinking about it some more and, and then trying to come up with a name. And then we came up with Boneyard Safari because each aircraft goes on a safari through its life as an aircraft from when it's built to when it's reclamated or broken up. And very much like a ship, it's, you know, journeying across the skies versus the seas. And 
So then we decided, okay, well, we've got to come up with a logo. And so the logo came along, and it was very comical because it was, okay, we, we don't want something that's too raunchy, because that's definitely out there, but we want something that's tasteful, but also is the legacy of aviation dating back to pinup art. And so we came up with the, the design and a lot of detail into her shoes, making sure it's the, the right uh, heels for the 40s. And so lo and behold, uh, had come up with a name, had come up with a uh, logo and everything else and decided, okay, well, let's make a f website and then a Facebook page and Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn and TikTok and every other YouTube thing. And and, uh, and by the way, we love that we only have minimal followers on YouTube. We like that. Don't join us. Don't follow. <laughs> don't like and don't fall. Just watch. <laughs> uh, running joke with a few of us where uh, uh, there's a couple overlanders. They're like, like and follow our YouTube. I'm like, no, don't like and don't follow us. Just stop by and watch <laughs> if you want. Uh, so anyway, so we uh, created the website, put it together. It was uh, a couple other guys and I. And um, uh, we just started discussing more about, hey, what are we doing with this? And then I started thinking about it. And working for the Air Force Reserve in telling a story and doing the recruiting imagery, the goal there is very much, hey, we're trying to inspire somebody who's 10, 12, 14, 18, 22, maybe up to 30, to say, hey, I want to join the military, and I would like to do this. So very much so it was, there's a story about the person, and then there's a story about the aircraft. So we started the Facebook page, and the idea being was, hey, here's an aircraft, here's the tail number, and here's a basic history of it. And next thing you know, everybody comes out of the woodwork and says, I've been on that plane, and I did this with it, and I have a story for you. I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And, you know, this is a secondary side business for me that really is just kind of fun. Yeah. And next thing you know, I started thinking about it. I'm like, well, we can take photos. We can film this. Why don't we start filming these people? And doing that and then letting the legacy of the aircraft live on so next thing you know it business is really starting to take off uh it's expanding we're getting calls of my favorite one was i had landed on a monday morning in lax making a connection and our business number gets forwarded to my cell phone sometimes so the office number calls and somebody calls in and says hey i want an f-15 for my front yard and I said, well, unfortunately, can't really do that. I, uh, there's a, yeah, uh, and, the, and, and it was kind of stumbling through, hey. There's a process here. Yes, <laughs> that's probably not going to happen. He was very, very upset about that. Uh, so once we, we started sharing the imagery of aircraft, it just started expanding. And more people started popping up saying, hey, I have a story about this aircraft. And then we had people in general aviation just saying, hey, I'm working on restoring this aircraft. Uh, there was a gentleman up in Seattle that worked for uh, the museum up there, and he did the work on um, essentially putting back together the XF-8U, the, f I think, first or second Crusader. Oh, wow. And uh, did a beautiful work, and he said, hey, would you like to come up and take a look at it and film it or do whatever you want to do? I said, of course, you know, I checked in with the museum. The museum was like, hey, this is great. Uh, and it's kind of funny because our projects have really started expanding, expanding, expanding. And our team has expanded in the sense of uh, a, a lot of people that are aviation oriented, whether they're active duty military, retired military, or just in general of aviation, has said, hey, we want to be a part of your team. Mm -hmm. And so next thing I know, I've, you know, there's been a, a shift in business where I'm running around over here doing all the advertising work and working other than the Air Force Reserve. I'd, at the time, I've been working for Marriott, Hilton, and Hyatt doing their uh, imagery. So it was a lot of juggling. And this business has started coming on up. And so I decided, well, hey, let's embrace this and let's have this run somewhere. And, um, you know, next thing you know, it's, there was requests of like, hey, we want to do a tour. And I'm like, well, I can't give you a tour on the base. That's totally not allowed. <laughs> but you can take the bus tour through Pima Air and Space. 
And um, so we had had access to one of the salvage yards here in town. And uh, I asked them, I said, hey, would you mind if we did a once a month tour? And uh, the owner there said, yeah, no problem. You know, we figure out a percentage. And uh, then our volunteers that are, or retirees that are uh, here in Tucson, um, Charlie Post, who was a C-141 navigator, um, said, hey, I, can I come along and help with the tour and talk about this? And one of his aircraft that he trained on over there uh, is in there. It's a 737-200, so a T-43. Um, the Air Force doesn't fly him anymore, but uh, it's there and it's intact. So it's a lot of fun for him to be able to walk around and be like, hey, I actually flew on this plane and I can tell you a story. And personally, that gives me a lot of warmth. Uh, it, it's just, it's really amazing because the amount of people that come through on the tour varies uh, in, in knowledge of aviation. Some people have no idea about aviation. They just want to see the old aircraft. Uh, some are engineers and then they start asking us questions, which I then I'm like, I'm so sorry. Well, I'll look that up and get back to you because <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, so it, it's been a very unique evolution of where we've gone. Um, the, the hands-on tour, we actually stopped for about four or five years and uh, decided to restart it this year, which there's been incredible interest um, and, and some very funny antidotes that I'll tell you about later <laughs> about some of the characters. I, I can imagine, and I guess that must be the, the two sides of it, you know, the, the direction of the imagery that, that you create, but also seeing people interact with, with the aircraft out, out on the, the reclamation yard, seeing yeah. just what's, what's going on. And I guess, you know, with, with the volunteers you bring in and things, how, how is that changed you in a, in a way that maybe you look at your subjects in a slightly different way as you get more of the stories and these things become a little bit more than bits of metal once you can put people to them. It's, it's been a really learned moment for me. Um, and it's also taught me to be very flexible with a lot of things as well. When this first started, when Bonier and Safari first started, I had my favorite aircraft. And I said, oh, I really love you know, this aircraft, or I, I really love this helicopter. And knowing that there were so many people that worked on so many different aircraft that have a love for their specific aircraft, it had me step back and start looking at everything going, okay, well, that's really not an attractive aircraft. Or, hey, it's a four-bladed aircraft that doesn't do too much. How can I, you know, think about this and, and make this? And, and so it, I literally stopped, thought about it, and I said, okay, stop having a love for one specific aircraft. Have a love for all aircraft. And even in the maybe not so most beautiful aircraft, find a beauty in them. And for me personally, it's been really a journey of, of learning. Mm -hmm. um, not only learning about the aircraft where the project's based or if we're doing a hands-on tour or if it's if we're on a road trip, but it's learning to adapt to what the questions are going to be and then share the details. Uh, for example, at the hands-on tour, there's an aircraft. It's sister. It's a prior C-47 so C R-4D, so it served for the Navy in World War II and after. And the sister to this aircraft is in the Naval... Uh, museum in Pensacola hanging from the roof and it went down to the Antarctic in 1947 so it's now just bones but being able to walk by and say hey the sister to this aircraft is right there so sorry for the long-winded answer no 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 that's great we're, and we've got some lovely F-16 yes yes F 16 yeah they, they, they come over from the air guard base on the Tucson airport there we go. Yeah. So, dear listener, we are actually here in Arizona. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that that was that was fantastic because I, you know, it's one of those things that aircraft are incredibly subjective. Yeah. And yeah, told you earlier about what my top three were. We'll come to yours in a bit because people know what my top three are. Hello, typhoon fans of the world. Um, <laughs> but it is not objectively. It is not an aesthetically pleasing aircraft. Right. But I find beauty in it mainly because of the stories of the people 
yeah. around it and its history, things like that. And I guess that sort of comes in the same way when you're looking for that beauty in something that's, I know people who think a Hercules is an ugly looking aircraft and yeah. I think it's the most beautiful thing yeah. ever. But yeah. it, and it can do so many, so many different things. Yes. And the lifespan has been so long and still being built today, yeah. which is incredible. It, which, which is, yeah, and, and that's it. And But someone will turn around and go, oh, it's a bit deadly. It's yeah. propellers. Yeah. Yeah. It's a trash hauler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I, for me, that sort of thing is always the Star Wars moment. Yeah. Yeah. You walk in and I, you still remember the first time you see Star Wars, you see the Millennium Falcon, you go, wow. Yeah. Luke goes, what a piece of junk. Yeah. <laughs> and it's that subjective thing of he's... He's right. looking at it as something completely different, whereas we're seeing this super cool spaceship. Right. Likewise with aircraft, yeah. we look at a, a Hurricane and go, oh, it does this, does that. Right. It's amazing. And someone else just goes, that's a cargo plane. Yeah. It's not a fighter. Right. <laughs> so I, I guess that's, that's, what, that's what you're saying, is, is to switching from that purely, I guess, taking your ad, advertising hat right. or, and putting it on backwards as opposed to taking it off, looking right. at something differently. Because... I suppose with the other half of the job, there's lots of things that you need to show in a different light that that may not exactly be at first glance right as pretty as one right yeah. pretty terrible way. Of <laughs> well, and at the same token, it's one of those there have a love for every single aircraft, and it's not a forced love. It doesn't sound right, but it, 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 it's <laughs> one of those, there's beauty in every single aircraft. Mm -hmm. It may not be aesthetically pleasing, but its purpose, there was a purpose behind the design. Mm -hmm. And that purpose was accomplished with that design. And for example, in C-130's case, first it was designed just to, to haul cargo, and then it expanded from there into a gunship and, and it, all the different aspects of it. Um, Heck, it's, it's a platform that the Navy used uh, to be in contact with the ballistic missile submarines, TACAMO. So there's so many different facets for that platform. Uh, you know, you look at like the P-3, you know, it was originally designed as a commercial aircraft, the Lockheed Electra. And uh, then it became something completely it, different. It, it was beautiful as an Electra, it was beautiful as a P-3. Yeah. Love the P-3. Yeah. So let's, yeah. Let's, go, let's go into the process, really. So yeah. let's... Let's take, for an example, a recent project with moving of the self fighter down here, which you did the filming for, and right. which is incredible. what goes into the preparation for capturing a big move like like that, because it's going to be something that intrinsically will get lots of people interested, interested and excited because it is an unusual object, should we call it? it? And it's it's something that for I guess people of our age, right. Desert Storm. Right. When it burst into the world scene, it was this otherworldly thing. Right. How do you then capture that moving quite a distance across across the country? And I, I don't want to say it must be easy to photograph because it's it's a lovely looking thing. <laughs> Again, objectively lovely looking thing. How, what, what goes into long rambling question? What's the planning for capturing a project like that? Because you've you've done many of these, but right. that must have been something a little little bit different because it's. It is as unique, as unique, ungainly, I suppose, is a good word for yes. it as well. Uh, oh, it's there's a lot of behind the scenes hours mm -hmm. uh, of learning. And what you mean, you don't just show up and point your camera? Oh, wait. <laughs> Anybody got a, an iPhone? iPhone 25? I've heard it'll have the greatest camera ever. <laughs> and it'll be like 12K. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, the fun part of it is learning, and I think the best adage that I can share is one of the things um, growing up and, and watching movies is when possibly a, a sound person puts the wrong sound for a helicopter. The famous one is the Huey helicopter sound of the whoop, whoop, whoop is put on a Black Hawk or it's put on an Airbus. Or it's put on anything. It's just the regular helicopter sound. The, air, uh, the airplane diving sound. Right. <laughs> yes. And uh, or, you know, I, I'm a big, big lover of the movie Airplane, yeah. which is, you know, a 707 with radial engine sounds, <laughs> which is absolutely comical. And that movie never gets old. So for me, stepping back from that, uh, the perfectionist in me is very much like, hey, I need to 
know as much as I can about this specific aircraft, this history, the designers, all the, the, the milestones, as well as the, the side stones that, mm -hmm. that happened about the aircraft in order to convey a message about it. And that message is only, in, in the case of the F-117, it was a short trip. It was two and a half days. Uh, and it was, for me, it was about two and a half months of preparation. Wow. When P. Mayor and Space and Scott uh, Marchand shared with me, hey, uh, we're getting an F-117. Would you guys like to cover the move? And, uh, you know, I said, of course, that's uh, this will be the closest I've ever been to an F-117. Saw many of them, but on the ground, but could never get close because there was always an armed guard or no, no, shoo, shoo, go away. Uh, so for me, it was, wow, really not an attractive aircraft in the sense of aviation wise. You know, it's totally different. So then it became the mass... Uh, in-depth dive in learn as much as you can find every book possible out there and uh, my other half looks at me and says why do you have so many books I'm like because I need to be able to know <laughs> as many details and be as accurate as as possible because the last thing we want to do is put some incorrect uh, fact out there because you know the joy of our fan base or followers with Boeing and Safari and having a large group is if we do something wrong uh, we'll know within minutes and uh, so it, tell, tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, no, it's like, hey, uh, we had an interview recently where somebody was talking about a B-52H and the person on camera uh, was filming and said, oh, the B-52G behind me. And it was like, oh, stop, uh -uh. full stop. That's an H. Let's not. And then the, uh, the person on camera was like, oops. <laughs> so. Uh, knowing the detail and, and learning about the aircraft and and what it has done is is really the key. And then from there, it's starting to figure out the logistics. Okay, what is the route planning? Uh, contacting the, the, the trucking company and getting as much information from them. We do a lot of work with worldwide um, aircraft recovery. Mm -hmm. And so the route planning is very specific. Once they have the route survey, they'll send me a copy of it. So I can then start looking at okay, where are photographic moments? Where are the good filming moments? Where to be in front of this, whatever aircraft that's being moved? And then from there, there's also the other aspect of we help handle a lot of the press interviews that come up as a plane's being moved. And uh, I'm a bit camera shy, so I end up being on camera, which is always a lot of fun. Where I'm like, oh, my hair, I gotta lose weight, a lot more weight. How's my hair? Anyway. Why do, you, why do you think I do a podcast? Yes. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, I have to do that more often. <laughs> no pictures, no pictures. Anyway, so and part of that planning is reaching out to all the different news agencies and saying, hey, we're going to be in this time frame coming through here. Uh, we can set up an inter interview for you, and here's all the backstory on the aircraft and what's going on. And occasionally we'll provide footage to uh, the news agencies. So if we have aerial footage or whatever else there, which is helpful for them because then they can get the message out and show what's going on instead of them standing next to an aircraft filming. Um, so there's a, a significant amount of planning in the sense of, okay, what's the route? What's the details of the aircraft? And then, you know, as we get all the pieces in place, there's always a change there's consistent change and i've just learned to be like oh, okay is it happy hour yet no i'm just kidding <laughs> uh so we adapt to it as it goes along um you know one of the the things is the the filming aspect so being able to real time get the footage out is really critical generally it's it's a team of two when it's just me out there it gets to be some really long days. I mean, we're talking 18, 20 mm -hmm. hour days. Um, but the beauty of it is what we'll partner with whoever the other group is, let's say with the F-117 that we recently uh, were part of the project, we'll partner with PMA Air and Space and say, okay, we'll send you half of the footage that we get and we'll use half the footage that we get on, on our side. So the benefit from there is there's different imagery, both still and motion, that's used from two different sides, but we also then include hashtags. And so that's the other part of the plan is looking ahead going, okay, what kind of hashtags do we want to use? 
and what's going to be short and memorable and get people interested and start sharing that story. Um, and it's funny, speaking of podcasts, a, a lot of times when I'm going up to or going to or wherever I'm traveling, I'm listening to podcasts about the specific aircraft. Oh, right. Okay. So, which is a lot of fun because, you know, there's incredible uh, plethora of knowledge out there. And so then it's being able to retain that. And then once we're on the road, being able to, one, share with the trucking crew. Because sometimes the trucking crew is like, it's a plane. So I've learned over the years is, it, well, it's more than a plane and here's some stories for it. And then there's a little bit more of a personal note, uh, which is, is a lot of fun. So planning-wise, it's the more time that we have, the better. Um, we have a move coming up for uh, the F-4 Phantom, the Black Bunny, mm -hmm. that's in back. So there's a lot of planning with that. The, the major challenge with that one is it's a black aircraft, and it's an oversized load, and all the permits are for driving at night. Ooh, that would be fun. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, um, can we put some LED lights on that maybe do something fun? Never mind. Um, so there, there's a variety of uh, challenges. And if I'm speaking too much, please interrupt. No, 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 no. This, this, this is fascinating because I followed the, the move on, on your side, on, on the PEMA side quite closely because I knew I was coming out and right. yeah, all of the arrangements for uh, yeah, partnering with PEMA on this. Yeah. It was dropped in quite late. Oh, by the way, we're getting a stealth fighter. Right. To which you go, oh. <laughs> Because again, it's the same thing you, you, you've seen at a distance or it's flown over at an air show or you've seen it over the Super Bowl or, or something. Right. That's a bright about it. Yeah. Dear listener, I've not seen it yet. They've not let me into that part of the museum. I'll mention it to Scott. But I, I, I can change that. Yes. <laughs> Here, let's yeah. run out the back door. <laughs> Come with us. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. <laughs> Here we are at the Pima Air and Space Museum with one of our two uh, Sikorsky Dragonflies. The Dragonfly was one of the first helicopters to go into service with the U.S. military. The Air Force, the Marines, and the Navy use them. This one was used by the Coast Guard. Um, it was the first helicopter used by the Coast Guard. They were heavily used to kind of set up doctrine for search and rescue for the Coast Guard. So a lot of what went forward with more modern and powerful helicopters after this was all stuff that they learned using the Dragonfly. Um, this one did do a, a stint on one of the Coast Guard icebreakers because um, they usually had helicopter support with those. It's interesting to take a look at these earlier helicopters that used World War II style piston engines, like this one had a Pratt & Whitney R98. So it limited a lot of the payload these types of helicopters could take. So it really was until you started having turbine engines and helicopters, like starting with helicopters like the Huey, that helicopters were actually able to start carrying larger amounts of troops and carry more equipment and more crew, weapons, etc but this is one of the ones that started it all, like with the Bell and some of the other early helicopter designs. And now, back to the show. Understanding what goes into capturing that, because yeah. it's, you know, for, 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 lots of, for lots of people, yeah, us amateur photographers, things like that, creating images for our own use, print them out, put on the wall, that sort of thing. It's very much happenstance, it's capturing an unexpected moment. Right. Whereas, as you're saying there, you can't just sort of show up on, on day one and say to everybody, yeah, we're going to be here, take a few pictures as we go. And I suppose by planning that out, you can start understanding actually, this would be you know, great terrain, there's going to be yeah, right. great, good light, th things like that you can right. plan into it. Right. Um, because from, from my aspect, it's more interesting knowing all of the effort that's gone into that and not knowing that it's just been a, a one-off right one-off so, thing because if something looks like it just happened yeah it, it usually hasn't and, yeah. and it's understanding the effort that goes into capturing that great moment and, yeah. I, and this this is this is why i wanted to talk to you because it's yeah it's understanding yeah and not just thinking well i can just show up he says showing up in arizona to grab people's time for, for a week. But I, I, I suppose 
with, with that sort of experience coming down, you know, the, <laughs> the fun of trying to photograph a, a black airplane at night, hopefully lots of road lights <laughs> along the way. What are some of the things that go wrong that you have to overcome? Because that's, that's, that's where things can create opportunity. Right. What, what are some of the, the sort of hiccups that you've faced along, along the journeys that you've taken so far? Because you, you've been involved in quite a few moves. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. How, how uh, many is it? Oh, Putting you on the spot because my laptop's dead and I forgot to look it up before I left. Right. The <laughs> um, oh, th there's been a significant amount. I, I apologize. I couldn't. I'd have to look through my laptop and figure out the, the number. I mean, it's it's been going on for quite a few years now. A good few. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, last year we had the B-52 move, which was the longest overland journey for a B-52, and it was here in Tucson. It was actually in the back of Pima Air and Space Museum, and it went all the way up to uh, Oklahoma City. Goodness. It took three and a half weeks, or just shy of three and a half weeks. So there were... Um, that was an immense challenge. Um, and, you know, I, I have to step back a second and share one other aspect of all the planning. Right. And part of that is a bit of marketing strategy in the sense of if the aircraft has an iconic logo, like, for example, Damage Inc., the B-52 from last year, what we did is we actually got stickers made of the uh, logo, the nose art, on the plane. So whenever we came up to a town or somebody came through, it was like, hey, here's a sticker of the aircraft. And that leaves a really positive memory with the team and, and with the, whatever the local town is. Um, and the other aspect is we're really appreciative of all the law enforcement that's involved in a move like this because generally there's anywhere from three to four escort um, law enforcement vehicles. And then... Because you are causing quite a bit of disruption. Oh yes. oh, yes. I mean, it, it everything comes to a stop, and uh, especially with a B-52 going down. Yes. <laughs> uh, an F-117 is very wide, uh, but it's also memorable. I, I think the funny one was getting an email from one of the news agencies that figured out that we were a part of it and said, hey, we got a report of a spacecraft moving through this town. <laughs> and my sarcastic side, because I had an English mother and, and, and New York father, my sarcastic side was like, yes, did you see the alien in the cockpits? <laughs> uh, but I, I resisted that. And uh, so it, it's really comical. And at the same time, we have to think ahead mm -hmm. of, okay, what are we going to run into up here? And, you know, the funny little side note is we go to the point of making coffee mugs and, and little things that the people that are involved with the trip, we can give them. And it's tied to them and that memory. And for me, it's a, it's a personal, hey, from a customer service side point, it's like that person was involved with this project for four hours or four days, and they can always look at that coffee mug and be like, hey, that's the plane that I helped move that caused all these problems and all this traffic and all these signs had to be taken down. And no, kidding. Uh, it, it, I guess it's... We can call it greasing the wheels, can't you? Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It, it's just it's little little things go a long way. Yes, and and knowing to be in front of that mm. really helps, uh, and, and it's also a, a, a gentle thank you. Of I, I remember we were on the B fifty two move going through a town in in rural, very rural Texas, and it, it had one stoplight that was in the center of town, and it was hanging off the string. And so we were going through, and that's part of the route for the aircraft is you never go on a major highway on, with something like a B-52 mm. because that will just destroy the infrastructure of the, the, the highway, not because of the weight, because everybody's going to stop. They'll all stop and be like, that's a B-52 going down the road. You mean people might drop off cruise control to have a look right, for a right, change? Right. Sorry, my frustration with right. driving around. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like, uh-oh, what in the world? Which, also another side note, I, one of the trucking companies had shared with me, one of the drivers has said that when they're moving a plane and they have an escort, they generally talk to the police and the, and the law enforcement will say, no, we're going to be doing this speed. And so they always make the suggestion of maybe we go a little bit faster and just for the sake of the amount of people that are going to slow down and want to, you know, mm -hmm. take photos or videos of, of the plane. And, and without a doubt, 
every time, generally the, the law enforcement's like, nope, we're sticking with this. And after like a couple hours, they're like, okay, we're gonna speed up now. <laughs> Because I suppose if you're just going too slow, you can create that sort of oh, yeah. jam of, of yeah. people around it trying to, yeah. and then trying to get in the front to get, yeah. 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 So it, it's, um, and I apologize for all the segues. No, 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 no. Going no. off course. I mean, there's so many, getting back mm -hmm. to the question of the unexpened things mm -hmm. that happened. Um, it, well, going back to that small town with the light. So we're coming up to make this turn, this right-hand turn. But the center of town where we're making the turn is sort of a high center. So the, it's on a hill, but a very gentle hill. So it then becomes, okay, the plane's too high to get underneath this string line. So fortunately with the B-52, they had airbags so they could raise and lower the aircraft. Uh, so in the meantime, I'm recognizing what's happening. Pretty much the whole town, it appeared, had come out and started looking at this. The one lone police officer that was there was sort of in the middle of the street in his car, not knowing what to do from from our perspective. So I saw what was going on. I saw how the plane was slowing down. It was taking longer and longer. So I grabbed a coffee mug, grabbed a lanyard, some stickers, and a whole bunch of other stuff, drove up to him, and uh, and in the we lovingly call her the Boneyard Defender, so right-hand drive Land Rover Defender. So I pull up next to him. He's giving me a quizzical look of you're right next to me and your steering wheel's on this side. And I said, hey, thanks for all the help. Here's a, a coffee mug and some swag and, and, and I'm really sorry about all the traffic and the, and the problems we're causing. And the guy just looked at me, looked at the mug, and he's like, oh, thanks, man. <laughs> and, you know, sure enough, I talked to him about a couple things, and that was just enough time for the plane to get moved. And uh, he said to me after that, I'm like, well, hey, we're going. And he said, hey, do you mind if I come with you guys for a while? No, 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 no. Are you going to put the lights on? Yes. Okay, awesome. <laughs> you want to be out front? And, and so it's, it's very much a, it's a dance. It's, mm. it's a moment of, of recognizing, hey, we're, we're start, a problem is starting to happen. And I see where the people that are getting frustrated with it and just getting in front of them and saying, hey, Thank you guys. Isn't this amazing? <laughs> and I guess that takes a little bit of the, the pressure off the transport guys because they can just worry about getting, guessing through yeah. and not having to yeah. detach and explain. Calm, yeah. calm, calm down local right. police. Right. Yeah. And for the most part, everybody knows, but there's always somebody that doesn't know right. about the routes and somebody's always complaining. And so in doing these trips, I've really, over the years, learned to identify, hey, that's going to be a problem there, or we have a discussion ahead of time, this is going to be a really tight turn on a town. So sometimes the trucking company talks to local law enforcement. Sometimes it's, hey, Ramon, can you go talk to them and just let them know what's going on? And, and the other part of it is reaching out to them saying, hey, this is pretty unique and historic. Uh, we're doing photos and video do you want us to share with you guys so you can put it on your social media? Yeah. Which of course they're excited about. So it's, it's, it's really, it's customer service. Yes. <laughs> and, and I, I suppose it, it, it's customer service. It's, it's building good memories because there's chances are similar parts of those routes can be used again. Yeah. And when you ring oh, yeah. up again, it's, yeah. yeah. You, they can remember that it was, yes. Okay. It caused a bit of a traffic jam, but it wasn't, it wasn't terrible. Right. And it's yeah. Okay. Increasing. I'm using a terrible analogy. Um, <laughs> so, I suppose it's been it's been a, you've been going for a while now. You've done quite a few moves. Uh, what time is it? Yeah, um, <laughs> we've been going for a while. <laughs> we, yeah, we'll see what happens next. Um, what do you feel is 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 the future for this? Because there's quite a few opportunities coming up. In yeah, you know, chatting with Scott, there's there's always things that just pop up out of the woodwork. What what is what is your dream for the next step for for Bonus? If you're allowed to say if it's not something top secret, but you know, you have what for many of us is you know a great sideline here with with this. You, you get to travel around, you get to photograph and film aircraft in unusual places. Is there going to be something more? Is it just doubling down on this, or uh, there's always something more? Um, I'm so, so relieved you said that. Sorry, that's one of those questions. Yeah. Like, no, we're just going to keep doing this. Yeah, yeah, no, no, we're good. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I look at and read a lot of different things and have had some really influential leaders that have been in my life that I've been honored to 
have a little bit of their time. And one of the things that I've learned over the years is always be moving forward. COVID happened and all of the regular advertising, director of photography, filming work pretty much stopped for me. Mm -hmm. But what didn't stop was Boneyard Safari. And unfortunately, it really didn't make a lot of money, but I said, hey, I love aviation. It's, it's just a passion of mine. Um, I remember being four years old. I was born on the Canary Islands. My father was a New Yorker. My mother was English. That's a whole different story over beverages. Uh, <laughs> but I remember at four years old going to Grand Canaria Airport and the Concorde came in. Mm. And so my father drove us up there and we saw it. And then I remember it taking off. I can still hear it and I can still see it. Yeah, and I think from yes. that moment, yeah, literally I feel the vibration in my heart. Like <laughs> um, that moment, it was, I love aviation. And so going forward to your question is, you know, the future for Boneyard Safari is there's multiple levels. Um, one thing that I actually was inspired by the um, John Boyd, who I believe you're going to meet, uh, also works for Pima Community College as in the archaeology department. And he was showing me how they map out uh, ancient burial grounds and ancient uh, spots from Native Americans, and they'll use drones. So he, I went over to his office one day, and he was showing me how they 3D map a space, and they, in this software that they use that I can't remember, uh, it actually removes all the shrub brush, and then you can see the indentations into the ground. So, hey, this was actually like a hut or somebody's house, or it was a food storage area. And so I started thinking about this and going, well, we have drones. We don't have the software that's very expensive, but we'll work on that later. But there's an abundance of aircraft wrecks throughout the world. Uh, and there's still more planes in the sea than there are submarines Yes, in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, moving forward, I started thinking about that and I was inspired by that. And I said, well, there are some really difficult places to get to. Uh, and having the Land Rover Defender, it's the benefit of being able to get to those locations. Not quickly, though. Uh, <laughs> she's not a speed demon. No, you'll get there. You'll make a lot of noise doing it as well. Right, right. <laughs> yes, and some parts will probably fall off. But it's gotta, okay. Gotta you know, love a disco. Oh, yeah. So in that, it's been a very formulative process of, of realizing, hey, this is something that's off the shelf. We have this um, product, like, i.e. the drone. Mm -hmm. We have the knowledge of the aviation. We have the knowledge of where the site is. And if there is the other aspect of it is we can go out, film this, and then you can actually see the impact points. Generally, there's not much debris left. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to have a metal detector, and, and that's not something we do. We don't go out and dig up a, a, a place where an aircraft crashed. Mm -hmm. It's just verifying, yes, this actually did come down here. And something on a personal note that I really... Uh, thought about was, hey, if there was an accident and there was a loss of life out there and it's somewhere really remote, we need to have a plaque. Mm -hmm. Because generally what happens is the debris is removed, everything's cleaned out, and nobody knows that, you know, X, Y, and Z airmen or air crew lost, lost their lives out here. And so a personal thing is, okay, we need to come up with a, a small plaque and to be able to put the names of the individuals that were lost and put it there probably only snakes and, and rodents and whatever the critters are <laughs> out there will ever come across it. But if somebody does, then they know they're honored and, and they're there. Um, and then the other aspect for us moving forward is we do a lot of support for aviation companies. So, um, for example, Ascent Aviation that's based here in Tucson, they do heavy maintenance MRO work mm -hmm. on aircraft, and they're uh, both at the Tucson Airport and Pinal Air Park. And so our job is to support them in messaging or filming short pieces, documentary pieces or commercials, whatever they need, which is a lot of fun because we get access to something that the general public doesn't. Unfortunately, we can't share any photos, darn, <laughs> which I'm always like, I really want to take that picture. <laughs> and I really want to post it, but I can't, I can't, I can't. Um, so that has been really nice and and that continuing work and that is expanding it's ex actually expanding throughout uh, the world 
Uh, we just did a piece for Air Serbia of one of their new aircraft. Uh, it was an A330 uh, that went out. So that was a lot of fun knowing the marketing side, the advertising side, and knowing aviation. Um, and then really for us, there, we're always looking at new ideas. And for example, yesterday uh, I received an email from JetBlue and it was based, one of their um, head reps that's based at JFK. And he said, hey, we're doing a project with the New York Fire Department and we need this section of a door of an aircraft. And my first thought was, well, you're JetBlue, you can do that. Mm -hmm. you, you, that. But then there's the realization that no, they can't go find a door off of a reclaimed A320. So learning the background on it, the reason they want that is so they can teach the crews and they specifically want an A321 that has been gone through a reclamation where the aircraft's being cut up and they want to cut that door out so they can teach the New York firefighters, hey, this is how you gain entry to an aircraft. Mm -hmm. Without actually having to do it to an actual aircraft that's at a gate, they can have a mock-up similar to the one that's right around yeah. the corner here. And they can practice, okay, this is how you open the door and get in. So for us, it's a lot of problem solving and every week there's a new there's a new problem that needs to be solved. <laughs> it keeps you on your toes, I suppose. Yeah, yeah just a bit. Ron, thank you for this. You're this welcome. has been so much fun. I am a fan, so it, it's I've been great to geek out, and I know a lot of a lot of the listeners are as well. And um, we'll make sure we share all, all the links, even to the thing you don't want people. To, okay. <laughs> you, YouTube's a weird thing at the best of times. Right. But <laughs> thank you so much for your time. No problem. A pleasure. I can't thank Ramon enough for joining us here on the Damcasters. It was great fun to spend time with him at Pima, and we've got some fun stuff coming up around the Stealth Fighter and maybe some other bits as well. So watch this space for that. He may not have wanted me to include the link to the YouTube channel, but that is in the description below, along with all their other social media channels as well. Because if you're not already following Boneyard Safari, and I'm sure many of you are, you really are missing out because. The content that they share is fantastic. And of course, top merch as well. I believe there's a Tempest coming soon. So get on that, dear listener, as it is really top quality content and stuff. Of course, I'd like to thank the Pima Air and Space Museum, not only for their continued support of the podcast, but also for setting up the chat with Ramon when I was in Tucson. And like I said, for some of the other stuff that we have coming up with him later. Your support of the pod is stellar, and I can't thank you enough. Things are ticking along nicely, but of course, it can always be better. Tell your friends. Stick some stars into your podcast app of choice, because that really helps the algorithms. And if you fancy becoming a Damcastier, yes, we're making that a thing. You can join us on Patreon from three quid a month plus fat. There's some stuff coming up on that, which will be fun. There is also videos that I'm producing very slowly indeed, but they go up on the Patreon channel as well. So we've got me blathering on about the first of the few, which is probably going to be out by the time everybody hears this anyways, but we're going to be doing some more bits and pieces around that as well. So if you fancy that, great. All the content ends up free to air anyways. So I know times is tough. Tell your friends. That's the cheapest and easiest way to show your love for the show. And it really is touching that everybody's been tuning in and the feedback that you've all been giving me has been really great. Of course, you can get in touch if I've not talked about something and you do want me to cover it. So drop me an email at contact at the damcasterspod.com. That's all one word, except for the dot and the com bit, of course. And let me know what you want to hear or yeah, social media, all those sorts of things. Until next time, Thank you so much for listening and do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone, and it is a Boney Abroad's podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to boneyabroad.com.